The meeting is now being recorded. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, May 19th uh, meeting of the State Bar's Finance Committee. Um, as a reminder, this, uh, this meeting is being, uh, being recorded. Um, and I'm gonna ask our uh, committee coordinator, um, uh, Mimi Harvey, if you would please uh, call the roll. Broughton. Present. Delenn. Here. Deleg. Tony. Present. We have a quorum. Okay, very good. Um, do we have, uh, um, I wanna uh, provide uh, time for public comment and I wonder if there are any members of the public uh, that may be in the queue to provide public comment to the committee. We do not have any hands raised at the moment for public comment. Okay. Um, with that, I think we will move to um, uh, the chair's report on the, uh, uh, for the committee. And in, just in the interest of time, there is no chair's report today. I think that there are um, a couple of items in particular, the, uh, the admissions fee item, I think which is gonna take, may, may take up a little bit of time. Uh, and so um, uh, not really a chair's report uh, today. Uh, I'd like to move to the, uh, the consent calendar and ask whether or not there are uh, any members of the committee uh, that'd like to, to, uh, to pull an item off the uh, consent calendar. Mr. Tony. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Sowell. Um, yes, um, I'd like to remove the minutes so that they can be amended. Very good. Um, Mr. Tony, if it's okay with you, can we, uh, the minutes is uh, item A in the consent calendar. Can we do item B first and dispense with that and then come back to the minutes or, or should that's, we? That's fine with me. Okay. Um, uh, can I get a uh, motion to at least uh, take up uh, item B on the consent calendar? Which one is item B again? I'm sorry. It's uh, the licensee request for adjustment of fees, penalties, and charges. Right. I'll did move. you ask for a motion? Yes, I did, Mr. Yeah, I'll make the motion, sorry. All right, very good. Can I get a second, please? I second. All right, Ms. Del Ms. Uh, Mr. Broughton makes the motion, Ms. Dellen seconds that we um, move item B on the consent calendar. Uh, take a vote on that, please. Broughton? Yes. Delenn? Yes. Tony? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, and now um, Mr. Tony uh, had asked for item A on the consent calendar, the minutes um, to, uh, to be removed from the consent calendar. And so Mr. Tony, I'll turn it over to you for uh, some of the, uh, for any sort of additions or uh, amendments to that. Um, I. I if I could ask, um, Araceli, did you have a chance to take a look at the question and maybe you could provide a, a quick clarification? Yeah, so I believe for the minutes, um, there was a small typo on uh, the second page, um, which we have corrected now. Um, and, and how does it now read? So uh, it now says moved by select, seconded by Dellen. Um, I think initially it was both you and select on there, so we corrected that. <clears throat> Very good. I, I, I'm, I'm fine to move adoption of the minutes with the corrections uh, as stated. Second. So uh, moved by Mr. Tony, uh, seconded by Mr. Broughton, I believe. Uh, I think he, um, Ms. Harvey, may we take a vote on that as well? This is for item A. Uh, the uh, further correction to the uh, to the minutes. Broughton? Yes. Delenn? Yes. Tony? Aye. Motion carries. Very good. Um, so let's get to the to the business at uh, uh, at hand. Um, 
Uh, the first item up is a discussion of the 22 admissions sort of fee uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, our chief financial officer, um, uh, Araceli Montoya Chica, will make the presentation uh, on this item. Yes. Um, good morning, committee members. Okay, I'm just trying to see where everybody on this call is. Um, so the first item are, are in our agenda is the admissions program fee analysis. I will be presenting, um, I will be showing a PowerPoint presentation shortly. Um, I'm waiting for Andrew, who's gonna help me co-present and I don't see him yet. But um, to give you a, a quick a little background, if if you recall in our uh, February board meeting, um, when we adopted the budget, when we adopted the budget, uh, I presented a summary of all of the funds and the reserve balances. And the admissions fund was showing a very significant structural deficit, uh, close to $9 million. Um, and I said that we were at that time currently looking into, currently looking into what are some of the causes for that deficit. And we were uh, doing an assessment to identify those. So in the past two months, uh, Andrew, who just joined in, uh, Lawrence, who I still don't see on here, they've been working very diligently on this project um, and they've worked very close with our admissions team. Um, so Amy, Audrey and Tammy are from the admissions office and they've worked very closely with um, Andrew and uh, Lawrence. Um, and I've asked them to join just in case there's questions, they have more in-depth knowledge on the admissions programs. So I've asked them to join just in case questions do arise that they're better able to answer. But now that we've concluded that assessment, um, so now that we conclude that assessment, uh, we will show you the what, what we've discovered as, as part of that assessment. So I'm going to share my screen um, to start the presentation and let me know once. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. So let me start the presentation. Um, so all of the programs uh, in admissions that we did that we did review, these are all programs that are supposed to be, you know, fee-for-service programs, meaning they're supposed to be self-funding, self-supporting, self self-funded. Um, the fees that we charge are supposed to cover the costs. Um, none of the programs are supported by the general fund, so none of the annual attorney fees are used to fund these programs. Um, Starting in 2017, uh, we made a recommendation to assess these programs every five years. So, you know, in 2022 was that fifth year where we needed to start doing an analysis again. Um, and just a little bit of history, the prior review uh, was in 2017. Um, and these are the seven admissions uh, programs that were reviewed as part of that um, assessment at that time. I will say not all of the admissions programs were reviewed, but these are the seven that we did review um, in 2017. We actually also did review some of the ARCR programs, which are the three listed here. Um, we currently are now moving on to do our assessment over ARCR programs. Um, we've started that uh, fee analysis now and we will present those results probably um, in the next board meeting once we finalize that, that assessment. Um, so here's the summary of um, the admissions programs that we did review and the results. Um, as you can see, most of them didn't result in any increase in fees uh, other than the last two, the law school regulation and the legal specialization MCLE providers. Um, that one was, you can see the fee increases by what I put here on the slides. Um, for legal specialization, um, there was an increase of, uh, for the single activity providers, it was increased by $37 and the multiple activity providers, MAP, that was increased by $150. Um, now these are uh, the, bar really, the bar exams of the first year and the moral character determination. We didn't assess these programs in 2017. And that's really because um, these three programs had a fee increase of 5% in the prior two years for 2015 and 2016. So we didn't, we didn't need to uh, reassess those in 2017. So those were not, were not looked at. This year now, uh, that we the assessment that we basically just completed, we did look at all of the 12 admission programs and those are all listed here. Um, these are the programs that we, uh, that we looked into for the revenues, the cost, see which one's in a deficit position, um, where fee uh, increase might need to be recommended. And in the next slide, I will show you the summary of 
the programs that ended in a deficit position because I think there's only two or three that um, were actually in a surplus position. So not every single admissions program is in the red right now. Um, this, so this slide is the summary of all of the admissions programs that are in a deficit position. Um, as you can see, most, uh, a significant portion, it's, it's the bar related exam. So the bar exam, the moral character determination and the first year law students exam. Those are three most, um, those are the three programs in the, with the most significant deficiency. And they actually account for over 90% of, of the admissions program deficits. Um, so we analyzed, you know, how did admissions get into such a, a deficit position, a significant deficit position? So we looked at different trends of different factors. Obviously, there's the impact of revenues and expenses that drive the, the deficit. Um, for 20, our 2022 budget, um, we do see lower revenues. Um, we see a trend, a decreasing trend in bar exam applicants uh, occurring over the past few years. Um, and there was also, I think we all know about the exam soft issues um, that resulted in a lot of credits and refunds that we had to forecast into our 2022 budget. So thus, you know, reducing overall revenues for 2022. On the cost side, we do have, you know, expenses pretty much increasing throughout. Um, on the services expense category, we do have a new vendor, um, that we outsource to administer the bar exam. So those costs are increasing. Um, similarly on the exam related expenses, we do see that proctor rates have been increased over a year. I mean, in 2020, um, the average proctor rate increased about 57%, which is a pretty significant increase. Um, also testing accommodations have increased both in terms of the number of people asking for the testing accommodations um, and also the cost uh, of accommodations itself. Um, so in, in the upcoming slides, we go into the various um, data trends that we see um, for uh, testing accommodations and expenses that you will see coming up. So here's a summary of um, the revenue and expense trends for the past couple of years. Uh, and I'll, I wanna highlight a few things in this slide. Um, first, this is in our 2022 budget is projecting that $8.9 million significant deficit. Um, recall though that only about a million, a little bit over a million of that is expected to be a one time and that's really due to the refunds from the July um, issues we had. So really about seven and a half million dollars, a little bit over seven and a half million dollars is expected to be an ongoing deficit. Um, at the end of 2022, um, that significant deficit is eating into the reserve. So we just budget wise, the admissions fund balance is expected to uh, end 2022 at a little bit over uh, $1.6 million. Um, so obviously that fund balance is not sufficient um, to keep admissions in, in you know, 2023 and beyond if, if it really does end up being in a deficit position. So we really need to address uh, admissions, the admissions deficit. Um, I do wanna highlight our budget versus actuals for 2020 and 2021. Um, historically, we have actually budgeted um, to be in a deficit positions, but our actuals have resulted in a surplus. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that our 2022 budget deficit will be lower. I don't know that it will be in a surplus position. Uh, it might be unlikely, but you know, something to consider since our, our budget or actuals have actually come into a surplus the past couple of years, the past few years, compared to our budgeted deficit that we've, um, that we've established those years. Um, for 2020 and 2021, you see, well, in particular for 2020, you see the revenues were actually higher, our actuals were higher than um, our budget. And for that year, I will just say that um, because of COVID, um, we turned everything into being an online format versus in person. So there was more applicants who you know, were able to take the exam given that it was taken online versus in person. And similarly on the expense side, you see that our expenses were a lot lower than what we had budgeted for both 2020 and 2021. Um, and a big, you know, a big uh, factor was the online exam. We basically got to save on all of the costs that we normally incur when we administer the exam online excuse me, in person. So doing it online did save us expenses uh, for sure. In 2022, 
we are budgeting um, the exam to be fully in person. So that's where the costs you see have increased again. Um, in terms, another thing I wanna highlight is you see this indirect cost line um, and you see it as a percentage of total expense. So from a budget perspective, you see the 20 from 2020 to 2022, the indirect costs are increasing significantly and they do account for a significant portion of the overall cost expenses and admissions. And these are costs that we really don't have too much control over. It's based on the headcount in that office and it's based on the square footage that that office occupies. So it is increasing. Um, however, when we sell the building and uh, this, if it happens this year or really whenever we sell it, we do anticipate that indirect costs are gonna decrease. So, you know, the, the it makes up a huge portion, but once we sell it, we do we do expect this indirect cost line item component to decrease. Um, and the admission and the headcount, you see that it really hasn't fluctuated too much uh, year over year. Um, however, you know personal costs, including the burden rates, they they have increased. Right, we st we still have our, our recurring annual increases and in our full adjustments and our uh, benefit components that do keep increasing year over year. Um, since personnel costs is another category where, um, you know, it, it has been increasing year over year. Um, so in the next few slides, we're going to go into the trend counts, the applicant trend counts, and we are going to go into the testing accommodation trends. And we're also going to get into the methodology of how we came up with um, our revenues or expenses and how we determine whether, how much to uh, increase how much a program needed to increase uh, the fees by to break even. And we also incorporated um, the admissions proposal for fee increases. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Lawrence, who's gonna talk about the next piece of um, the presentation. Thank you, Araceli. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to begin with some of the big factors that were driving the revenue projections that we put together, the applicant count being one of them, and as you can see over the last couple of years, uh, what the trend is. And the one thing that I wanted to point out was the bar exam trend. As I recently mentioned earlier, you can see the last couple of years, um, there's been a significant decrease going from 18, you know, a little under 19,000 uh, down to just a forecasted a little under 13,000. And what I want to point out is this is the, the number of applicants fee payer trend as opposed to test takers. And there's gonna be a, a distinction between that because not all applicants end up sitting for the exams. So um, that is one of the big drivers for the bar exam and one of the biggest, uh, I think, portions of the deficit we see for the admissions office as a whole. Right, go to the next slide. The next thing I wanted to talk about here is the testing accommodations. And this trend also you can see um, in uh, 2021, we see a downward trend in, in the folks that have sat for the bar exam who um, asked for testing accommodations. Um, overall, you can see the last couple of years as a population, as a percentage of total test takers, it's been reasonably flat. But um, what I like to point out is um, at that bottom table, between 2018 and 2020, the per unit cost is roughly 13 to 16% higher for testing accommodation applicants versus non-testing accommodation applicants. So effectively, it's very expensive for us to uh, support and, and, and have the testing accommodations for, for those test takers. Um, as you can see, um, there's a slight uptick or a quite large uptick, excuse me, between 2020 and 2021. You can see that um, the average goes from roughly uh, 2,400 for the you know, testing accommodations to close to 60, 6,200. Um, some of the drivers that are, uh, I think, attributing to that increase is um, during COVID, we saw that um, slight decrease uh, in 2021, and that's because you know, more people could take the exam online. So there was a, um, less of a need for the testing accommodations. However, as we go back to in-person exams, we should see those testing accommodation, test taker counts normalized back to pre-COVID numbers. 
Um, and then, so as far as the per unit cost trend, uh, that trend should also go down from the 6,200 back down closer to the 2,400, but it should still increase as our testing accommodation costs go up. The big drivers are primarily COVID related. So one of them being um, the need for more rooms to accommodate COVID protocols, as well as uh, you know, other COVID protocol safety expenses for, uh, for staff, proctors and applicants in the sense of PPE and, and that sort of thing. Um, one last driver for the increase uh, in the per unit uh, calculation is that uh, during COVID, we started using or including additional costs that weren't used previously. And, and those include things such as um, the greater printer costs, the exam soft license and tech costs, as well as PPE and the, uh, the multi-state uh, exam books and scoring. So that's, those are the main drivers for the uh, increase in the per unit cost going. Uh, it probably will sit somewhere between 2400 and and 6200 but not at that 6200 level that should be that should not uh persist moving forward um, you can go to the next slide so this is uh a summary of how we looked at the fee assessment exercise and the methodology that we took um, here you can see on the revenue the one thing that we did was based on a four-year historical applicant trend. And we looked at each fee and each fee had a different applicant trend history. And then we ran that and came up with an estimate for a run rate in the future. And then we validated those numbers with the admissions team. And then you can see it was a forecasted applicant count times the current fee for each individual fee. And that would give us a revenue projection. On the expense sides, there are four main drivers. Uh, the one, the, the form big, the, one of them being the, uh, the labor costs, labor and benefits uh, by program. And we made that assessment uh, based on allocating each FTE's time spent on a program. And then we multiplied that out by their fully burdened cost, which would be salary plus benefits and any, any other related costs. Um, there are also uh, FTEs or headcount that uh, we bucketed under management who were un we were unable to assign to a specific program. So we did something very similar. We um, um, added all those FTEs and then multiplied them out by their fully burdened cost. And then we assigned those costs based uh, to each program based on the size of the, the FTEs assigned to that program. Um, and third, indirect costs. This was based on the 22 budget for the San Francisco and LA interfund allocation that Araceli had mentioned earlier. And the last piece was the external costs. And this was based on the 22 budget because we were focused on costs moving forward. And then we made uh, an adjustment for any one-time costs that should not be included moving forward. And then adding back any future expected costs that uh, we expect after 2022. Um, and the costs include temps, contractors, building operations, services, which include professional services like PSI, we had mentioned earlier, supplies, equipment, which include software expenses, software licenses, other expenses, which include travel and the exam related costs. You can go next slide, please. So here's just a high level summary of how we came to our projection for um, whether or not the fee needed uh, to, to be scrutinized further to suggest or recommend a, a change in the fee. Next slide, please. And um, so this is an example of the exercise we did for every single program. And I think it's important to note that um, every program has a different amount of fees to consider. So here on that top section, you can see what the current projection has. So as you can see the current fee and then the current projection for each individual fee. And for the bar exam in this example, you can see that the projected revenue is roughly 12 and a half million. The projected program cost is roughly 16.2 million resulting in a deficit of roughly 3.6 million. 
Now, the bottom left-hand side is the what the fee would need to be increased by, in this case, 43% in order to break even. And you can see uh, it was roughly 43% across the board using uh, holding the count projections steady. And that would get us to roughly 16.3 with a, a net benefit of 109,000. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see what the admissions team initially proposed. And you can see that it is nowhere near the 43% in order to break even. It is uh, different. You can see the fee increases percentage-wise are different across the board. They looked at each fee individually and made an assessment as what they think might be uh, amenable. And as you can see, the, uh, the total would be an improvement of roughly 600, um, roughly 600, just shy of $600,000. So that still would leave a deficit of roughly $3 million. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out as well is um, we based this uh, break even and the admissions initial proposal on the assumption that we would come to, we would change the fee structure for the attorneys and general applicants to one fee, as you can see on that top section. We currently charge different fees for attorneys and general applicants, and um, the assessment was based on you having one fee. And uh, we'll go back, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, in the next slide based on uh, some work uh, by my colleague here, uh, Andrew. So um, you can go over to that uh, next slide. Thank you, Lawrence. So this slide illustrates the uh, data that's collected by the National Committee of Bar Examiners. And this is data that's self-reported uh, by each state. And the, the first thing to note is the, the green bars. The, there are 14 other states, including currently California, that charge attorneys a higher fee to sit for their exams than they do for non-attorneys. And some fees charge a fixed rate, some uh, a sliding scale based on number of years in, uh, in practice. So those are the green bars. The blue bars uh, indicate uh, in order of, of expense the, uh, the non-attorney fees. And you can see California, our current two fees just to the left of that, of that red bar. And um, the, uh, the, the red bar actually looks like it's been shrunk. It, uh, it, it should indicate the $800 unit fee that's being proposed by admissions. And um, if we adopted a single fee uh, at $800, this would move the non-attorneys from 23rd to 12th position compared to the other states, but the attorneys themselves would drop from 16th position to 25th. So this represents a plus and a minus 18% for both those categories. Lawrence. Thank you. So here is a good comprehensive view of um, all the different fee analysis that we had done. Um, yeah, I do understand this is a lot of data, but I think it's important to know that this was not a very easy exercise and we needed to look at each fee individually. And I think this table um, represents that very well. Um, and so you can see here um, by program and then by fee, what the current fee is, what would a break-even fee would be and the change, percent change or percent increase that would be. And then uh, next to that, the admissions proposal and what that equates to from a percentage change basis. Um, I think the next slide will be a little bit easier on the eyes. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is more of a, a program view of all the uh, recommendations or all the projections uh, proposals. So here, going back to that first table, uh, we can see a, a overall $7.8 million deficit. And obviously that next, table, you can see what the fee increases would be required to get to roughly break even based on the analysis that we perform. And then uh, to the right of that is the uh, initial proposal by admissions, which is a lot lower than what it would be required to break even. And so that would improve the deficit by roughly 1.6 million to get to that deficit down to 6.2 million instead of uh, 7.8 million. Um, here, we can go to the next slide. So with that said, we do have a, a couple of ideas that we can, we can consider. Uh, number one, obviously, we, we talked about fee increases. Um, 
And then secondly, we can look at uh, subsidies from some of the other funds uh, that we, we have our, um, that we could consider. And then uh, third, um, which we'd obviously like to avoid because um, it would impact, I think, uh, level of service, I think for the most part, um, reducing some costs uh, and the expenses. <clears throat> so, um, are, are, were you going to? No, I was just going to say that's that's the conclusion of of the presentation. Um, if we'll not open it up for uh, questions, anybody has on on the presentation and the numbers you saw, methodologies. Maybe Arnie, if you don't mind, if I could just kind of tee up the. Um, Discussion. This is a discussion only item. We're not asking the Finance Committee to make any decisions. And there's a couple of issues that you heard uh, throughout the presentation that I just want to elevate. One is this issue of equalizing the fee for attorney and non attorney applicants. That is predicated on the understanding that we are constrained uh, by statutory provisions or constitutional provisions that only allow us to charge fees equal to our costs. And it may be that that understanding that, that I've certainly been operating under for the last several years may not be exactly correct. And so I've asked the Office of General Counsel to assist in helping us understand what flexibility we have in terms of the fees that we charge. But just so you all are clear, the attorney exam is one day, the non-attorney exam is two days. It does not cost us more to administer the exam to attorneys, it costs us less. So if we are constrained by that provision, uh, then it's difficult to justify uh, charging attorneys a higher rate. If we are not, then that's a, a much different conversation and th then we get to bring policy, public policy into the, into the conversation. Similarly, I've asked the Office of General Counsel to opine as to whether or not we need to look at each fee within the admissions program as its own distinct entity that needs to be self-supporting um, in a silo fashion. Because if we can look at the fees holistically, there are some where, again, on policy, public policy grounds, equity grounds, we would not have concerns about raising those fees. Registered in-house counsel, for example, uh, if we are able to uh, raise fees in some areas to subsidize or offset costs in other areas legally, that is an approach that certainly I think we would recommend as a staff team to the Finance Committee. Uh, but more legal analysis of that issue needs to be done. So just wanted to uh, point those issues out, Arnie, before we open it up to hear questions and Finance Committee observations on the material they've been presented with. Thank you for that, Leah. And I, I would like to uh, open the floor up to uh, any questions that uh, some of my fellow colleagues might have. Ms. Dillon. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, do you have any subsidies for the uh, attorney uh, fees at all? When, when you equalize it to 968 for, for both, how many of them would be able to afford that to um, be able to, you know, take the exam? And um, so for right now, that that, that is uh, my question. It looks like um, when when they are second timer, second time taker, do they also have the same? Do they also pay the same fee? So I'll, I'll try to answer the first question and then turn, turn it over to admissions folks who are on the screen here. Um, but I think under the assumptions that are included in the material you've been presented with today, the fee would be increased for non-attorney test takers, decreased for attorney test takers. So it would be equalized. And in equalizing, you're increasing the fee for one population, decreasing for the other. The attorney test taker is, Sonia, someone who's barred in another state. Say they're barred in Arizona and they want to move to California. So right now they're paying that 900 something dollars. Under this model, that would come down to $800. And the fee that non-attorneys pay to take the test, like a law student, would come up to $800. So um, I think if they can afford $900, they can probably afford $800. The attorney uh, 
applicant. But in terms of whether or not we offer any fee subsidies overall, and if there are any discounts for repeat test takers, I will turn that over to Amy, uh, the Director of Admissions, to answer. I was just, oh, I, hold on a second. I was, also, I was um, more concerned about the new, um, the, the students who are the, the, the oh, graduate okay. to our state. I'm not concerned about the... Uh, okay. All right. Whether they could afford the increase. Um, I, and I think admissions, that increased number, the initial number came from you. And I think there was some thought as to affordability. But again, maybe Amy, you can take the first stab at that. Sure. So um, the first one is, uh, so the price, the increase would go from 677 to 800, right, um, for uh, an, uh, a student applicant to apply. And so, um, you know, our projection, our recommendation wasn't for us to come in um, even uh, because we know that that would be a significant, uh, 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 would have a significant impact in students' ability to pay for that. So I think, um, you know, the 800 was uh, basically a compromise. Um, it'll help us, it's a step in the right direction. And as, as far as also your uh, next question about the, um, the um, cost for repeat takers, it's the same cost. So there's one fee for uh, one, uh, the same fee for whether it's an initial uh, application or repeat taker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I saw Mr. Broughton saying that. Sorry. Yes, I, I got a couple of my naive questions. Um, when we're talking about indirect costs, can you give me an idea of what those are? I mean, those are costs that are in addition to, I guess, in this case, giving the bar exam. So what are those? Or an example of them anyway? So um, the indirect costs, you know, are all the costs that we can't directly, right, associate to any, to any one uh, office. And every single office, not just admission, has indirect costs, right? It's, it's basically, for example, the cost of our utility, the cost of our um, rent, if we pay rent, um, those are allocated based, those are for admission specifically, those are allocated based on headcount in the admissions office, as well as the square footage that they occupy in both our San Francisco and LA buildings. Admission sits in both offices. Um, so it's basically, think of it as the overhead cost that, um, you know, all, all departments have to pay. Um, and admissions is, is, is no exception to that. And market includes HR, finance, all of those IT infrastructure support uh, services in addition to the physical sort of occupancy uh, costs as well. Mm. So when we're talking um, mostly about the bar exam here and we're talking about fees, I, I kind of, um, I'm curious as to whether or not the, the current attorneys, the licensees, that we already have, how much of their yearly fees go towards paying the bar exam costs um, that we're talking about, if any, and some of the other costs as well? Are we talking about increased fees to the attorneys or just increased fees to the test takers? Just, we're talking just increasing fee of the test takers. So the, the normal annual attorney fees, uh, you know, to renew your license, those, those are not um, used at all to cover, to cover these fees. It, it's, they're completely separate. And Mark, I, I think we pointed out in the memo that that too, uh, that one more than the other issue of being able to charge fees not in relation to the cost of the service, that one is a policy decision um, by the board. Uh, my understanding is the board could determine that it wanted to subsidize admissions uh, costs with our general fund licensing fee revenue, uh, but we have not done so. And as you know, we've been prioritizing using that licensing fee uh, to support OCTC in particular, but th those are choices I, I think that we've made, certainly since I've been here, I haven't seen an admissions subsidy uh, from the general fund, but I don't believe you would be precluded in doing so. I have, um, chair. I don't, I don't, Mark, are you? you, you Excuse me, that? choices. I, I, 
that that gives us something that we could consider in the future then. Yes. Mr. Brown, are you good? Mr. Tony? Let me go after uh, Sonia, because I think she's probably wanting to weigh in on this discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, just as a follow on, so the indirect cost, uh, that was actually one of my questions here that I've written. Um, those are allocated ledger entries and not actually paid. Is that correct? So, so such that when we do this budgeting that we do have the, um, the deficit, that is how we are able to, you know, continue on with, you know, the, have, having a budget that would have a deficit. Do the indirect costs are not, they're basically allo allocated, but more of a ledger entry. Is that a fair statement? Well, so they are allocated, um, you know, but like Leah mentioned, you know, when, when part of this indirect costs are all of the costs that we are incurring in the admission, uh, administrative type funds, those are costs that, that are paid, right? Or, or the administrative, you know, finances, is, finances costs, th those, we do pay those costs and they are, they are, they are something that we do spend money on. Meaning, I think, Sonia, if you're asking, I believe they are actually deducted from the admissions fund. <clears throat> I don't think it's just sort of a paper transaction, if that's what you're asking. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. That's yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So they're not part of the um, the FTE, uh, you know, the, those the human resources that uh, you know generally, but they just there actually are taken out of that fund to pay for, uh, you know, an examiner, uh, 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 a proctor or something like that. Well, the indirect cost, and Arsali, correct me if I'm wrong, but the indirect cost is transferred. Um, it's a charge from the general fund to the admissions fund or any other area of the bar. Mm -hmm. And where it's a, that funding is in a separate fund, like admissions, I think there's a draw from the admissions fund to support those general fund expenditures. So it's actually coming out of the general of the admissions fund. In addition, the direct costs, which would be proctor costs, um, admission staff, like yeah. those are direct costs. That's also drawing down from the admissions fund. Okay. Sonia, are you you good? Thank you so much. Mr. Tony. Thank you. I, um, I first want to say, I, I want to really thank the staff that worked on this report. This was a lot of fun to read. I love the level of detail in this. And um, I, it, it, it just told such a, just such a complete story, at least from my point of view. So I, I really, I really appreciated it, okay, and had a lot of fun with it. And it's, um, and so I actually want to start my questions. Uh, Leah, I would like you to repeat what you said at the beginning of your explanation of why you're looking at um, adjusting the um, attorney versus non-attorney fee. Um, could, could you restate what you said? Yes. So when I um, first uh, came to the bar, I was interested in a progressive fee structure for our licensing fee, whereby attorneys that make more money would pay a higher licensing fee than those that don't, okay? And we, we do have a fee waiver, as you know, for the very low income, but we don't have a progressive fee structure. And what I was told at that time is that we were precluded by either the government code or the California constitution itself from charging fees uh, greater than the cost incurred by us to provide the service. So that means if it costs us $50 you know, to provide a service, and it doesn't cost us more money to provide a service to somebody who's higher income, then we can't charge that higher income person more. So that has been the organizational understanding. And I would say the, the Office of General Counsel at the time that we did the 2017 fee analysis 
also gave that directive. So we are always looking at breaking even on costs with the understanding that we can't make money and that the fees charged have to be related to the cost of the service. So fast forward to this issue. There's the two day, um, the bar exam is two days for non-attorneys. They've got to take the multi-state exam and they have to take the California exam, just to put it simply. If you're an attorney licensed in another state, you only have to take the California exam. You're only taking one day. So it doesn't cost us more to administer the exam to those people. It actually costs us less. So if we are bound by a prohibition uh, or a constraint around the fees we can charge, that it really, we're not justified in charging attorneys more because it actually costs us less to deliver the exam to them. That's why, that's why we came at this from, okay, let's just at least equalize it. We're not going to charge them less. Let's equalize it. But we may not be bound by that. That's what I've asked. So, so um, I'm curious why in 2017, why was a different fee structure adopted? for attorneys and non-attorneys. We've been operating under that for the past five years, is my understanding from this report. And I wanna know um, how many times have we been sued for it? We've been operating on it way more than five years. I think that's what it's been in place. And I think it's in place in many other states. And to my knowledge, we have never been sued on it. Uh, okay, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that I, I, uh, I'm not sure where the problem is here. Let me ask a related question. What is the, um, one of the things I appreciated was the breakdown of the costs for uh, testing accommodations. And it's clearly uh, people who need testing accommodations, the cost is far greater. How much more is their fee than other uh, applicants' fees? How much additional do they, are they charged? And is None. The, Okay, not, and, I, not, I, and, I, and I have not yeah. seen a proposal. I have not seen in this proposal a uh, you know a, a you know you know a proposal to make their costs reflect. And we can't do that. Yeah, yeah Robert. Robert. Yeah, we, that we, one, I know we can't. Do. Okay. Yeah, we can't charge them more. Would be put, putting a kind of a roadblock to them um, taking the exam just in the same manner as anyone else. If we if we make it more expensive for them. Okay. Okay. Well. Well. Um, I'm going to suggest that equalizing the, um, the fees between attorneys and non-attorneys actually takes us down a slippery slope because the justification that I am hearing at this meeting suggests that attorneys should be charged half of what non-attorneys should. And I'm not sure we want to go there. You, one day versus two days. I mean, I mean, the thing is that if you, it, it, if you start down this road of saying where well, we're going to equalize it because it costs us less to, um, uh, for attorneys, then the question is going to be, well, why aren't we charging attorneys less than non-attorneys? Okay? So I, I, I just want to say that the logic has um, vulnerabilities, um, unintended consequences. Now, I will say that um, the, you know, I understand the principle that you cannot charge more in fees than it costs to administer a program, okay? That is solid, but I am not certain how granular that breaks down, okay? And the fact that we have had no issues with having a higher fee for attorneys and non-attorneys would suggest to me that we wanna keep that principle, keep that protocol, keep that practice. Um, and you know, if we have a huge deficit, it makes no sense to reduce the cost for one of the elements of the revenue, one of the revenue elements. Um, we're gonna be raising costs, everybody should share the pain of raising the fees. It should apply to everybody, not just some people. And so I am, I'm, a, I'm a little like, um, I, I would be much more comfortable with keeping what we've been doing forever, 
however many years it's been. Um, I, I, you know, I, we, we haven't gotten no complaints about it. Let's keep it. And we, we lost you. I don't know if you went on mute or not. No, I'm still okay. here. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I lost about 10 seconds of what you just said. I okay. It, 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 I think it's important for us to keep what we've got now, which is a differential between attorneys and non-attorneys. I, 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 I think the main principle here is that we don't want to charge more for fees than it costs to administer the program. We're not in any danger of doing that right now. It's, you know, the opposite. And that it's really important, um, you know, I, I mean, what's being brought up is this issue of cross subsidies. And I don't know that cross subsidies are a problem in and of themselves. I think that they need to be transparent. They shouldn't be hidden. And that in fact, attorneys can, practicing attorneys from another state can afford to pay more than non-attorneys. And I, I, I support that. I think it promotes equity goals. We got some equity goals in our strategic plan. And so I, I'm comfortable with that. And I, I think my, I, I have two other points if I could. One is that I think we should actually come up with a proposal and I, I like the direction of proposal number one. We should come in with a proposal that covers the costs, period. If that's what we're supposed to do, let's do that uh, with a differential, keeping a differential. So I like plan number one better than plan number two. I appreciate that you presented the committee two plans, two scenarios. I appreciate that very much. I like scenario number one. And what I would suggest is that we float scenario number one to some of our stakeholders between this meeting and next meeting. Let's float that scenario to the auditors. Let's float that scenario to the, uh, our legislative partners, see what feedback they get. When they see that proposal, maybe they'll come up with other ideas, but um, they want us to run a, both those parties want the state bar to run a fiscally responsible organization, okay? And um, the, uh, you know, the scenario one allows us to do that. That's one. Two, we should do these annual reviews every two years and not five years. That, that, to, to me, that's the, that's the bottom line of what I learned from reading this, that five years is far too long to not have a review. So that'd be my other suggestion. I know, I, I know we're just brainstorming now. We're not making decisions, but I wanted to put my thoughts on the table. Thank you. Very good. Um, I too have a couple of questions. I think that that uh, um, fall on the same some of the same lines that uh, my colleagues have, have already sort of pursued, but wanted to uh, just to, to add my sort of two cents and, and a couple of things I was sort of struck by. Uh, uh, Leonardo Selly, I'm walking out of this conversation one with the fact that um, since none of the uh, the attorney licensing fees are used to subsidize. Uh, the uh, uh, the admissions exam sort of process that that also lends itself as a possible sort of solution if we if, if we were to go to go down that road and we aren't barred from doing that so I'm, that's one that's more of a statement than anything else that 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 was that was uh, that was made uh, here's the second thing that I was sort of struck by and Leah was something that you said and you said that we are trying to figure out whether or not we have to um, I, you didn't use this word but it was look at each one of the exams or sort of essentially sort of delineate each one separately uh, or not. And what struck me, I think by, and I hope I'm not putting, you know, not misinterpreting what it is that you said, but what struck me by that was um, the statute that we're using to say that we have to, or we're, we're relying on to say that we have to uh, uh, charge reasonable sort of fees. To me, the operative, so, and I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, but, but to, to me, sort of the operative statement in that or the operative part of that statute is applicants uh, for admission to practice. Every last one of these different exams 
are applications for admission to practice. And so I look at this as a, a, a maybe more holistically as opposed to individually. And would think that we can, we can charge all different sorts of levels that we would consider reasonable combination a combination to um, deal with the system as a whole, not for an individual exam. Is, and I know that that is something that um, it sounds like we're gonna try to get researched uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the general counsel to, uh, to pursue, but that was sort of what, what sort of struck me uh, uh, by uh, uh, not only sort of your statement, but also just sort of looking at uh, this part of the code is that this is a, this is a, a system of admission not just an individual exam um, way, of, way, of, way of looking at it. And so, uh, if I, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I could, be, I, I could be completely off, but it was something that just sort of struck me. And then I think my question is, um, we know this is an informational item and, and please respond to anything it is that, uh, that, I, that I've, I've, I've said or I may have misrepresented. Um, but uh, I think my question is, this is an informational item when uh, would this committee have to be, when would you come back to this committee uh, based on some of the questions that you've heard, some of the suggestions that you've heard uh, with uh, something that we would have to act on? Well, I think that's um, going to be tough to answer. We're going to need to do it certainly before the adoption of the 2023 budget, given the projected year end uh, fund balance for the admissions fund there are a lot of balls in the air. So for example, you saw the variance between budget and actual for the prior two years. We need to take a look at what actuals are actually looking like this year now that we are back to the in-person exam format. Um, another uh, variable is the sale of our building. That's not, it's not a variable related to the admissions fund. But if we are given some latitude to use proceeds from the sale of the building for this type of purpose, um, that may be something that we want to throw into the mix. And we're not going to know that for a couple of months. We then we obviously need time for OGC to do its analysis. And I would say that it's going to be quite expansive. And so I'm also going to ask them to look at the legal specialization fund, which is a very healthy fund balance is very uh, financially robust and we've always treated it as a completely distinct fund that we cannot use to subsidize admissions activities. So that's so, so we need to give OGC time. So this is my long way of saying, Arnie, I don't think it's going to be the July meeting. It will need to be the September meeting um, because we will at that point need to uh, get you guys to a place either at the September meeting or maybe a specially set meeting in October to make some decisions so we can build the budget for 2023. And we should have answers to all of our outstanding questions then. And I'll just say I've taken uh, good notes of the comments of the trustees and we, they're appreciated and we will, I'll make sure the attorney working on this is aware of them and can include that information in our analysis. Very good. Any other sort of comments or questions by my, my colleagues before we close out this informational item? Uh, seeing none, uh, why don't we move on to uh, item uh, number B, I think, which is next on the agenda, which is uh, the discuss of uh, proposed amendments to rule, it uh, looks like 2.11, and I think, uh, I think, Leah, you have this. Yeah, this should be a quick item. I'm asking the Finance Committee to approve the issuance for public comment of amendments to this rule, and the amendments are designed to give us uh, new flexibility or the ability to uh, either move uh, non-conforming licensing fee payments to the end of the line or reject those payments. Uh, as outlined in the agenda item, we have uh, a significant number of payments each year. This is for the licensing fee, not, not obviously the admissions fees that are non-conforming. When, when we talk about non-conforming payments, we're really focusing on payments by check not online payments. And these are uh, payments that are not accompanied by the official paper invoice um, that enables the easy and efficient processing of the check payment uh, by Wells Fargo Bank. So it provided in the agenda item 
some numbers there for you on the payments that are rejected by the automated processing at Wells Fargo that then require manual uh, review and uh, reconciliation by our staff, resulting in overtime costs and temp help costs in the race to get all of these processed by February 1. So uh, seeking uh, approval to issue for public comment this rule amendment that would basically say if a payment is non-conforming, we don't have to process it by February 1. And I want to be clear here that the impact, if this rule amendment went into effect, would likely be uh, more late fees being assessed to individuals um, who uh, make these non-conforming payments. But I do not think that sort of the ultimate penalty of uh, suspension for non-payment of fees I don't see any likelihood that that would increase as a result of this rule. And because folks have paid, we will process them, but we just won't race to process them by February 1. Um, so I'll just pause there. Again, this is simply seeking authority to issue this for public comment for 60 days. We would review the comments uh, at the July meeting, and then there would be a request for action at that time. Any comments or questions for my colleagues? Mr. Tony. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I was trying to figure out, uh, I spent a lot of time on this issue to try to figure out what was going on. And I really appreciate the time that Leah spent with me and the time that Araceli spent, because it really helped me get a better understanding of what the issue really was. And what I ended up realizing, and what, what I, I wanna recommend something a little differently than what's in here, that the goal here, the outcome that I think that the State Bar wants is for more um, uh, people who pay their fees to be compliant, which basically means to send in the form with the barcode um, you know, and the numbers to make it easy for processing. That's the outcome here. We wanna increase the number of people doing that. And um, right now the enforcement mechanism being suggested is a late fee. And it, it, it seems like this isn't, th th that the issue isn't that they're late, the issue is that they're non-conforming. And so what, what I want, what, what I came up with after these discussions is, I think what we should be looking at is a non-conformance fee that, that if it's, um, if you don't, you know, I mean, you know, you do what you want, right? We ask you to, uh, to turn it in with the proper uh, paperwork, but if you don't, it'll be a hundred dollar non-conformance fee. I think that a lot of people won't want to pay that. And that's the kind of incentive that will move people. And it doesn't confuse it with our late fee, especially if they got it in on time, they weren't late. And then you, you know, you, you're in an argument with people about whether they were late or not. Well, you weren't late, but you were non-conforming. So we made you late. And I'm saying, look, let's have a non-conforming fee. It's different from a late fee. We retain a late fee for people who are truly late, but everybody was non-conforming. They, they pay a non-conforming fee before it's processed. And if they don't get the money in, then they can have a late fee tacked onto it too. But I, I, I really think that if we want people to conform, you have to have an enforcement mechanism and, I th and provide incentives. I think a non-conformance fee just makes more sense. I don't disagree. And I'm wondering, because I'd like to get this out for public comment. I know, Arnie, I don't want to preclude other comments. Uh, but Robert, if you could take a look at the attachment, I think this could be effectuated by simply um, an additional amendment to Rule 2.13. Instead of saying late uh, payment penalties, it could say payment penalties or late and non-conforming payment penalties. But if you could take a quick look at that and, and we can see if there's other questions, Arnie, and maybe um, do a little editing on the fly just so we could get this out for public comment. Others? And Leah, would that be uh, something that is allowed under code, you know, uh, getting more ad uh, additional fees 
other than late. I'll let Robert answer, but I think. Yes, yeah, so I think we would. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear Sonia's question. I was looking at the rule. I apologize. Uh, I mean, it's just a different form of fee. And so is that something that is allowed under the code? Um, you know, uh, that you can, aside from, aside from the late fees, a default fee, uh, is it something that is allowable? Yeah, we can set our rules with respect to how we handle payments. I think that the issue that Leo raised is the, the draft rule references 2.13, which only talks about late payment uh, penalties. So we'd have to change the title and the, the text of the rule to include uh, late and non-conforming payment penalties in the title and in the text of it. But I think you could do that. Yeah, I think it, we could do it the way you see on the screen here. Late and non-conforming payment penalties, late or non-conforming payment of fees is subject to the penalty self set forth. And this schedule of charges and deadlines is something that is also approved by the board. And, and may I ask, may I add some more? Um, for to make sure that the non-conforming and the late fees are not the same amount so that there will be no confusion. Um, isn't there a schedule of changes? So we'd have to either... We have to add, a, we'd have to add, but we're not gonna, uh, that is not part of the rule. That's approved separately by the board. So we could bring forward what the, that charge would be separately when this rule comes back from yeah. public comment. Other comments, I do want to make note of uh, the fact that we've been joined by Mr. Board, board Member Saleh. Other comments on this one? Um, I think uh, I, I uh, am in agreement with Mr. what, what Mr. Tony is, uh, has proposed, as well as the um, sort of the, the kind of elegant solution that, uh, that we've come up here with on the fly. So I appreciate uh, that. Um, I think the uh, the only thing that I would just sort of add or, or, or try to make note of is that both the late fees and the non-conforming fees, this is something that folks would know up front, correct? You know, it wouldn't be something that after the, uh, uh, it, it's, it goes out with their, uh, the bill, so to speak, correct? No, that's right. And we would commit to doing a great deal of outreach, particularly to the law firms and other agencies that are some of the biggest um, offenders, so to speak, uh, well in advance and provide technical assistance to help them get set up properly on agency billing. Um, so if the rule is amended, we are committing to doing that. Okay. Um, I think I'm looking for a motion um, to see yes, I, I, I'm not sure if it's Louisa or Mimi who's doing this. I am going to send um, the edit that I just did of the rule over to you, Louisa, unless you've already done it. No, I have not. Okay. I just sent it to you so you could put it up, but I don't think the resolution itself doesn't need to change. So, Mimi, would you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, if, if the resolution doesn't need to be changed, go ahead. All right, I see. Is everyone able to see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I just want to be clear, um, uh, Leah and, and and, and others, do we do we need to, to take two actions here? Something that changes the rule, and then you know put it out before uh, for 40, uh, the forty five day comment uh, period separately. No. Okay. I think you could put the resolution up. That what's showing on the screen is not the change from the changes in the next page. It's in section two point one three. Yeah, that's the change added pursuant to the conversation we just had. But the resolution itself speaks to um, 
simply issuing the revisions out for public comment. Well, let's see what, what it says. The resolution may need to change actually. Yeah, it's, it's pr the proposed amendments to rule 2.11 and 2.13 would be the amended resolution. No, down and resolved. Proposed amendments instead of amended. To rule. To rules to 2.11 and 2.13. Okay, I think we're set. Um, Louisa, could you put back up the amendment to 2.13? I think there's a typo in it or a, an error. Sure, give me one I think it should say both rules are subject instead of is subject. Yep. I see it. I would change is to R. Okay. Um, give me one moment. While you're doing that, Louisa, I think I'm just going to I'm just going to make the presumption that you are you are correcting that and um, that we're good and just would ask for a motion. Uh, uh, I would like to make a motion to uh, put these rule changes into um, for the 45 day public comment period. Second. All right. Moved by Tony, seconded by Dylan. Uh, we take a vote. Rotten? Yes. Delane? Yes. Seleg? Tony? Aye. Aye. Did Sean, did Sean vote? You're, he's on mute. I saw him raise his, Sean, did you want to vote on this one? He's trying to. Sorry, I'm in a, not in my regular office. I'm having a little technical problem. So I vote yes. Very good. Thank you. So we have four yeses. Motion carries. And if you'd like to see, I've made the change here. Very good. Thank you, Louisa. All right. I think with that, we can now move to uh, item number C, which is a discussion of the 2021 uh, quarter four financial statements and 2022 uh, quarter one financial statements. Yeah, so back to me. Um, so if, if you recall at our March board meeting, um, I, I stated that we did not, uh, we were not able to complete the quarter uh, Q4 financial statements on time for that meeting. Um, and we would leave it for a later date. Um, so I presented the reports that were available at that time, the investment report um, at the March board meeting. So now, um, now we are catching up and I'll be presenting um, the results of the Q4 uh, financial statements and then I'll follow it by uh, the results of our Q1 2022 financial statements and the investment report. Um, and the resolution for these two will just present it all at once at the end. Um, and I will be sharing my screen to do a presentation. So once you see my screen, please let me know. Are we good? Good okay, so I'll start uh, really quickly going through our, uh, you know, basically 2021 uh, financial results. Um, and I'll first go through the revenue uh, highlights for the, uh, for, the, for the year ended basically 2021, and I'll follow it by the revenue highlights, uh, excuse me, expense highlights. Um, so starting off, uh, our, our total operating revenues for the year, as you see here, 
um, were slightly above budget uh, overall by about $2.6 million. Um, and this, uh, this slide and the expense line will show um, the breakdown by fund of those revenue and expenses. So first for the general fund, um, our revenues were below budgets uh, by about $700,000. And that's really due um, to uh, the affinity and insurance payouts. So um, affinity insurance, we, we receive revenues from our insurance partners. We take those funds and then those proceeds are submitted to two organizations, um, the California Lawyers Association and the Calabar Affinity. So these are really mostly passed through uh, revenues that we get. However, in 2021, if you recall, we, we did have an, a change in accounting method where we changed a lot of our accounting from cash to accrual. So um, for the affinity and insurance payouts, we ended up having uh, five quarters worth of payouts against four quarters of revenue. Um, the net of those two is what's cost, uh, you know, our overall net revenues to be below budget by that 700,000. Um, so that's, you know, in 2022, we changed the budget to align to our accounting. So we shouldn't be seeing these, these type of change in accounting method discrepancies anymore. Um, but that was, the, you know, the, the primary reason for the general fund uh, being slightly below budget. Um, the next line item is what I call the grants funds, um, and that's composed of the Legal Services Trust Fund, the Equal Access Fund, and um, the grants fund, which in 2022 was really mostly um, the Homeless Prevention 2 uh, program. The net of those um, revenues were $3.8 million above budget, and that's really composed of, of two components, the Legal Services Trust Fund revenues turned out to be higher than budget by about $5 million, and that's really just an impact uh, or a result of the number of lawyer trust accounts and the average balances on, on those accounts. Um, on, on the offset side, um, we did have less uh, revenue, less actual revenues than budget, um, primarily in the Equal Access Fund. And that's, that's because uh, there's administrative cost reimbursements that were for the HP2 program that were incorrectly budgeted um, for a shorter period than, than they should have been. So our actuals ended up being lower than what the what the revenue had been budgeted. Um, now, in the uh, moving on to the admissions fund, that came slightly below uh, revenues came slightly below budget by only about four hundred thousand, and that really is a result of, of the July exam software failures that you know we've mentioned um, multiple times. Now, moving on to the uh, expenses for the year. Um, Overall, our expenses, I think, if you've seen most categories, were below budget. Um, and the key driver for all of it was mostly personnel savings um, from our staff vacancies. Um, in particular, for the general fund, um, we had very, you know, we had significant savings of about 11, a little bit over $11 million. And that was mostly due, one, to personnel savings, um, and two, from uh, the pension expenses that resulted from our annual actuarial valuation. Um, our pension plan, or the pension plan, I should say, actually performed better than expected, um, and that resulted in a significant uh, net investment income earned. So while historically the pension plan had expenses, this, uh, the, the valuation results um, actually in 2021 were a gain. So that gain basically helped offset um, a lot of the expenses in the general fund categories. Um, moving on to the funds, the grants related funds, uh, equal access fund, that one came below budget, um, uh, expenses below budget by about $6 million. And that's really just due to a delay in the grant agreement execution. Um, so you'll see in Q4, our expenses were below budget, but when we get to the Q1 slide, you'll see that the expenses for equal access are higher since we basically shifted when the payout of those uh, expenses were paid. Um, for the Legal Services Trust Fund, that came uh, slightly above, uh, expenses were slightly above budget by about 600000 and that's really all due to the provisionally licensed lawyers program that was not budgeted for 2021. Um, and finishing up, uh, admissions fund, that came also under budget by $4.6 million, and that's two main reasons. One, similar to the general fund, the personal cost savings from the vacancies we've um, we've had during 2021 and all of the exam related expenses um, due to the remote exam um, that we saved from, from 
uh, not having to administer the exam in person. So those two accounted for the savings and expenses on the admission fund. Um, and the client security fund overall, um, the expenses were below budget by $2 million, um, And that's really due to the fact that we were, um, we made less payments as, as uh, fewer applications were, were processed um, and accepted than, than we had budgeted. Um, so now I'm going to move on to Q1 if, if there's no questions on our Q4 results. So as I mentioned, you know, our Q. Uh, sorry, just one second. Yes. Uh, um, sorry. I can... Yes. yes um, uh, you have to pay. Do we have some payments uh, for the uh, exam? You know how we're going, but we have to make some refunds or, and when is that happening? Is it, it, is it in 2022? So. Most of that is budgeted in 2022. There was a small portion of, of refunds that we did give in 2021, but most of that impact you will see it's, it's um, in 2022 budget for admissions. The Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, I'll move on to our uh, Q1. Mark. I have one oh, question, please. Sure, sure, Mark. Which is, um, um, maybe I missed it in your presentation. Bottom line, what is the delta between revenue and expenses for the year? I don't have it summarized here. Our revenues, uh, let's see, our revenues were 100, sorry, 185 million right. ended, and our expenses were 174. So right. roughly 10, 10 million. So, so we ended the year in the black. Correct. That's a overall. Good thing. Overall. That's a good thing. Okay, yes, yes. good. good I mean, job. Per personal savings really did have okay. an impact across most of the funds. Thank you. Sure. Okay, anybody else? I'll move on um, to our Q1 report. So now we're fully uh, caught up and uh, going forward, we'll be presenting a, on a quarterly basis the financial statement results and the investment results. Um, so similar to uh, the Q4 um, slides that I just presented, these are our Q1 uh, for the period on March 31st, uh, revenue results uh, by fund. Um, overall, we ended up slightly above, actually by above budget on the revenue side uh, by 5 million. And these are the, the fund components of that. Um, starting off with the general fund, we are as a Q1, 1.2 million above budget. And that's really just due to the mandatory fees um, that we received. We got more licensee payments than we anticipated in Q1. Um, the next line item, again, the grants related funds composed of the Legal Services Trust Fund, the Equal Access Fund and the Grants Fund. In 2022, the Grants Fund now includes the HP2 and the HP3 programs. Um, since we got funding in, in Q1 for HP3, um, that net variance was 2.7 million. Um, and it's broken out into uh, two main pieces. Um, first, I'll call out the grant, uh, the grants fund. Um, that was uh, $4.7 million higher than budget. Um, however, that was really due to a timing allocation discrepancy for HP3 in the budget. So the way we allocated our HP3 revenues um, was not correctly in our budget, in our adopted budget. Um, so we do plan to submit uh, an amendment to correct that allocation. Um, if we don't do that, these variances will continue to recur every single quarter. Um, so to avoid having these discrepancies, we, we do plan to make an, uh, a budget amendment um, to properly align the, the expected revenue we, we ex the revenue we expect in 2022. Um, uh, and the offset of, of that uh, revenue was lower revenues in, in the legal, legal services trust fund and equal access fund. And that was really just due to uh, delay in requests for those administrative cost reimbursement revenues that were not submitted until Q2. Um, the admissions fund revenues, those are slightly above budget, uh, about 1.3 million. And that's really just due to uh, February exam fees were better than we had anticipated. Um, admissions tends to budget more conservatively, but the actuals ended up being uh, better, or fees ended up being better than we had uh, budgeted. Um, the client security fund you see, is, it, it's fairly in line with the budget, only about $100,000 um, change there. 
Now, moving on to the expenses for Q1. Um, first, for the uh, overall, our expenses are higher. Um, and, and I'll get into some of the reasons why. But in the general fund itself, uh, our expenses are actually lower uh, by $2 million. And that's very similar to, to last year. We, we have had personal savings as of Q1 um, that are, are helping us uh, you know, incur less expenses as well as building operation savings um, as we do have lower occupancy or we had lower occupancy in uh, Q1 than we anticipated. Um, the next line item you'll see is the bank settlement fund. You see the bank settlement fund had actual expenses of 2.3 million uh, versus a zero dollar budget. This was another, um, we had some technical issues when we were uh, working through the budget. Um, the Office of Access and Inclusion had issues inputting some of the numbers. We thought we had fixed it, but you know, when we were doing our analysis, uh, there was a glitch in, in, in the numbers being properly captured. So unfortunately, the bank settlement budget was not properly updated in our adopted budget. So this, we will also need to uh, do a budget uh, amendment to correct this. Um, the good thing is the bank settlement fund, this is all the uh, disbursements that we expect for the year. It'll be $2.3 million. We don't expect to make any more disbursements at all during 2022. So it'll be a one-time thing. And once we submit the correction, this uh, large discrepancy will not be going for, uh, you know, will not reoccur in the, in the following quarters of 2022. Um, for equal access uh, expenses, as I mentioned, so expenses were higher by $5.3 million. And this is, you know, just like I mentioned in Q4, there was lower expenses because we didn't pay Q4 2021 um, uh, EAF expenses until Q1 2021. So that's really the reason why expenses for this fund are higher in 2021. It's just the timing of when the grant agreement was executed and the funding received. So. We, we incurred more expenses in Q1. Um, the grants fund, uh, you see that there's a huge variance in the grants fund of almost $20 million uh, actual compared to budget. Um, this variance is a mistake. Um, we did not accurately budget um, in our adopted budget the anticipated expending in 2022 for the grants fund. Um, I will just say that you know, these grant related uh, discrepancies in the budget and accuracies, um, they don't necessarily impact the state bar budget as a whole, just because these are, these are passed through revenues, right? We get the grants and then we basically disperse those entirely to subrecipients. So, you know, there isn't a significant impact as it's really just passed through revenues and expenses. So, um, but, you know, we do need to correct those, that these discrepancies do go away in the coming quarters. Um, if we don't correct it, you'll, you'll continue to see uh, those, those huge discrepancies. So we wanna, we wanna correct those because there were, there were mistakes um, as part of the adopted budget. Um, for uh, moving on, the Legal Services Trust Fund, that particular fund was uh, under budget in terms of expenses by about 700000 And again, that's just really due to the grant disbursements for the prov uh, provisionally licensed uh, lawyers program that was not paid until Q2. So really just the timing difference. Um, admissions ended up uh, slightly below budget by 300000 in terms of expenses. Uh, which is pretty well, and that's, uh, you know, similar to what I mentioned in the general fund. It's, it's personnel savings uh, from our staff vacancies that we've um, seen in Q1 so far. Um, and finally, uh, the client security fund is uh, also below budget by about $1.6 million. Um, we've had less payments made uh, as there are fewer applications that were processed than, than we had anticipated for the budget. <clears throat> So that's our Q1 results. Um, does anybody have any questions before I move to the investment report? No. No, I don't see, I don't okay. see hands, uh, Arisella. Oh. You can, can okay, can so I'll the, continue, yeah, sure. The investment report. I would just, just in the interest of time, Arisella, I don't know, uh -huh. maybe, maybe just can give us some of the highlights. I know we have one more item that we have to have. To mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'll really quickly, you know, our, our investment report hasn't really changed too much from Q4. Um, it's changed significantly, obviously, from the same quarter last year, but you see the market value here has gone down by 
uh, about $15 million or so. And that's really just due to our investments that have matured. Um, and we have not yet reinvested monies back into um, our, our Wells Fargo securities, which is where, you know, where the market value change has uh, happened. Our LAFE has, you know, it sits around $74, $75 million. There really isn't too much change in our LAFE balance, um, as well as our BNY uh, investment that sits around. So maybe this will be a, a good summary. This is um, where all of our investments are sitting, Wells Fargo, um, LAFE, and Bank of New York Mellon. The change from prior quarter hasn't really been significant. I think the market value in Q4 was around $111 million versus one hundred and ten in the quarter. Um, so not too much change really in the investments uh, piece. And that is all for uh, the Q1 and Q4 reports. So if you need, you can put up the resolutions to take action. And if anybody has any questions. I do want to make sure uh, any of my board, board member colleagues have questions. I don't see any. Can I get a motion? Move. This is Sonia. Sonia has moved the, uh, the Q4 <laughs> and the fi financial statements and the Q1 financial statements and investment report. Second. All right, I just want to make sure that we are. Does Dylan move Mr. Tony seconded? Can we take a vote, please? Rotten? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Celeb? Yes. Tony? Aye. The vote totals are four yeas, motion pass. Very good. Um, board members, bear with us. We have one more one more item on the agenda. That's item number D, and uh, the discussion of the approval of the reserve policy. And Araceli, I think this is back to you again. Yes, yes, back to me. So this is the last item on this agenda. Um, I don't have a presentation, so everything is, really is documented in the agenda that was posted, so I'll just, uh, highlight really quickly um, this agenda item, which is composed of two, two parts. Um, the first part is the reserve policy revision um, that we wanna propose. Um, if you recall, the, the reserve policy um, exempts uh, all of the grant related funds from being subject to the minimum reserve target um, of 17% and 30% on, on you near know, the floor and ceiling. Um, the client security fund is a very unique fund in that only the payouts portion was excluded from the reserve policy, but not the administrative portion. Um, and there is no policy currently in place that states where the excess reserves should go. Naturally, we, you know, they, they should go into the payouts portion, but just to align with the grant related funds, um, this, this uh, agenda item we want to propose to exclude the client security fund altogether from the reserve policy and to align it with, um, to align it like all of the grant related funds. Um, so that's the first piece of this agenda item, um, that, that revision to uh, the proposal to revise the, the reserve policy to exclude the client security fund altogether. Um, the second part of this is uh, the reserve spend down plans. So, um, when we approved the budget, uh, we uh, I presented to you all of the 2022 um, fund reserve fund balances. And per the reserve policy, any fund that has excess reserves, so anything about that 30%, um, needs to spend down if it's consecutively above 30, consecutive six months above uh, that 30% ceiling. Um, and there's a chart in, in the agenda item. So there were three funds that, uh, after doing our, our assessment, three funds that have excess funds that, you know, per the policy would require a spend down plan. Um, and those, is, uh, those three funds are the legal, uh, sorry, lawyers assistance program, the legal specialization and the legislative activities funds. Um, and I put in there a table that shows you the minimum uh, reserve spend needed to comply with the policy. 
Um, so I'll start very first with the Lawyers Assistance Program spend down plan. Um, on the minimum end, they need to spend about 250000 to be uh, in compliance with the reserve, uh, the reserve policy. And I won't go into all of the details, but their spend down plan is listed in the agenda item. Um, and I will say there, there is a business and professional code um, that states that uh, for the lawyer's assistant program, if it has excess funds, um, it may transfer those funds uh, to the client security fund, which is what we normally do. Um, however, we did consult with uh, the CSF staff and you know they indicated that there, right now there is no need for um, to redirect any of the excess funds from LEP into client security fund. So we've outlined a few items uh, that LAP wants to uh, their plan their plan for for developing uh, or sorry their plan for spending down and that's going to be about two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars so that's documented in the agenda um, the next fund the legal specialization fund this has a this is a significant amount of excess reserves so on the on the minimum spend side it's about four point six million dollars. Um, this fund, we are not, you know, even though it has $4.6 million on the low end to spend, uh, we are not recommending any spend down plan at this moment. Um, we just talked about the admissions fee analysis, and this is one of the funds, um, one of the possible solutions that we can maybe consider um, in funding part of that uh, structural deficit. Um, in the past, uh, the Legal Specialization Fund has been used to support admissions. Uh, most recently, uh, this fund loaned the admissions uh, office about a million dollars for the procurement of their uh, information management system. So, you know, it has been used in the past to help fund some of the admissions uh, costs before. So until the time as, you know, the board determines how we are going to address the deficit in admissions, whether it's in a short-term or long-term basis, um, we do not recommend right now spending down any of the funds in this fund. Uh, for that reason. Uh, and finally, the Legislative Activities Fund. So this is the fund that covers all of the lobbyist contracts and uh, the staff time associated with lobbying work. Um, this fund is uh, funded through voluntary donations uh, as part of the annual fee that attorneys pay. Um, however, the uh, preliminary uh, bill for the, the next year is going to convert this fund uh, from being an opt-out to an opt-in status, meaning that attorneys are not going to have to opt in to volunteer fees into this plan. So we do anticipate that there's going to be a significant reduction um, in funding as a result of this conversion. Um, that's Therefore, we, we are not recommending any spend down of, of reserves at this time for this fund, um, given that the incoming revenues will likely uh, be a lot lower than they had been in the past. And over time, this fund will naturally spend down. So no, no spend down either for, for this uh, fund is recommended. And that's all of uh, the agenda items. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, we can also put up the resolution to take action. I see Mr. Tony's hand. Yes, for the six uh, recommendations, that you have for the um, spend down of the uh, lap, lap spend down plan. Mm -hmm. um, do you not have authorization to do this without board approval? Um, it looks like to me that you can do this anyway. What's preventing you from doing this? The board does say any spend down above 250,000 requires, or, sorry, the board manual uh, does state that anything, uh, any spend down above 250,000 needs board approval. Okay. Uh, you know, look, I'm in favor of this. It's fine. Um, at a future meeting, I would like a agenda item and a discussion around the reserve policies, um, I think 17% and 30%, um, I don't think they're the right numbers. And I think that they're kind of confusing. And I would like to open up a conversation about what, what, how do we rationalize the uh, reserve policy? Not today, but I'm just serving notice that um, I think we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. 
duly noted, Mr. Tony, and um, uh, I was certainly happy to, to work with you and Leon in terms of when we might be able to bring an item like that back before this committee. Sure, we can do that. Other questions? I just have a- um, Oh, please, I do ahead. have a question. I have a question. Oh, please, um, Robert, um, do I need to recuse myself because I'm a legal specialist? This isn't affecting the amount of fees that specialists pay, so. I don't think so, unless there's no financial interest um, involved, so I, I don't think so. You could do it in the abundance of cautions if, if you okay. like. But well, I no, I, I, I don't think it's, yeah, if I don't need to. Um, I guess, um, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from the other comments, so that's fine. Thanks, Arnie. You got it. Sonia? I'm sorry, no. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure th this is the resolution. When I looked at the agenda item, I thought I saw two item, uh, two different resos. But this is the this is the right one. Yes. So it, it's two two. Uh, yeah. So we in the agenda item itself, uh, we actually uh, mistakenly left out um, the. Uh, resolution for the revision, the proposed revision to the reserve policy. So okay. here we've updated it to include both the action that um, we're okay. asking for approval of the reserve policy revision as well as the spend down plan. Okay. I need a motion. I move to approve the reserve policy revision and budget spend down plan. Second. Motion by Dellen, second by Saleg. Uh, we call the call the roll, please. Rotten? Yes. Delane? Yes. Saleg? Yes. Tony? Aye. The vote totals are four yays. Motion carries. Very good. The best of my knowledge, um, this concludes the business of the Finance Committee for today. Yes. Very good. So with that, I will move to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.